take a good look at the calendar. We are fast approaching the last month of 2022. Now, looking back, this year seems very busy, particularly when we talk about the foreign policies. For example, China and the US and also some major countries among the Latin American regions. And of course, that we can never forget one of the important countries on the planet, which is New Zealand. Now, in this episode, we need to talk about how those countries are linked together when we talk about foreign policy and also these economic factors that are actually pushing this global agenda forward. But meanwhile, some countries today are undergoing this social unrest and also struggling with the political stability. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to invite one of our distinguished speakers. It's Mr. Jeffrey Miller. Now, Jeffrey is the Democracy Project's international analyst and written on current New Zealand foreign policy and related geopolitical issues. Now, Mr. Miller, and welcome back to The Missing Piece. Thanks very much, Will, for having me having me on. It's good to talk with you again. Well, Mr. Miller, you know the pleasure is oh my. Now let's get to the questions. Again, when we look at the calendar, we are in this last month of 2022. Now, the first thing I would love to uh, get your take is the ongoing social unrest in China. And again, this is not just uh, happened in the last couple of days, but actually it's been going on for a while because this zero COVID policy uh, now, throughout the media, and also uh, I would pay attention to the content, that younger generations, or should I say people across the nations, actually held protests and rallies one after another and voiced their oppositions towards the lockdown and also towards the zero COVID policy, you know, in terms of stability. Now, given the fact that today Xi Jinping just renew his presidency for the third term. And also he attended the G20 summit. Mr. Miller, my first question is, how do you think that ongoing the social unrest can hurt Xi Jinping's political stability? And also, what does that say about China today? It's certainly a huge challenge. I mean, China is, is definitely always on New Zealand's radar. Uh, you know, my primarily my primary focus is on New Zealand's foreign policy and because China is New Zealand's biggest trading partner by far actually or a third of New Zealand's exports go to China every year uh, I'm always very interested in what's going on in in China so it's been very interesting to watch these protests uh, develop uh, over the last uh, couple of weeks or so mm. in in China. Exactly where it leads us is, I guess, the big question. I think there are a lot of parallels, uh, funnily enough, between New Zealand and China with COVID. New Zealand had a zero COVID policy as well, mm. and it's not that long ago. Mm. You know, this time last year, where you know New Zealand was was pretty much cut off from the world you know if you left new zealand as a new zealand citizen you had to fight to get in, into a quarantine hotel uh where you had to spend two weeks um before before you could go out into the rest of of new zealand and uh, that was the policy right up until march this year mm. incredibly and so um, you know, it's not that long ago that we had a zero COVID policy of our own mm. and we also got protests. Mm. There were big protests in New Zealand in February and March uh, with people who had had enough of of the COVID restrictions. Uh, New Zealand had vaccination passports that were used last in the last New Zealand summer, so this time a year ago, um, December, January uh, into February into March where you had to show uh, your vaccination status to to get access to pretty much all areas of public life. Mm. Uh, and this is what you've effectively got in China at the moment with the zero COVID policy. It's very similar. Mm. You've got, uh, it's, it's strict because it's China. Um, so it's obviously an authoritarian state. So they've uh, imposed much harsher conditions than New Zealand ever did. Mm. Uh, and that's probably why the zero COVID policy has gone on for longer there. You know, these mini lockdowns of, uh, of, of, of towns, you know, neighbourhoods and cities and so forth. Um, it's been much stricter than anything New Zealand had uh, and the quarantine camps and so forth that they've uh, instigated. Um, but, you know, it is difficult. How do you actually begin to unwind this? And that was New Zealand's challenge and it was a big problem for the government mm. because 
at some point you've got to let the dam burst. But, mm. You know, if you give up on the zero COVID policy, you're suddenly going to get a big surge in cases, and then you've got to hope, like uh, like anything, that your hospital system will be up to the challenge. Mm. And it was a big problem for New Zealand. You know, we suddenly had we went from virtually zero cases per day. We had maybe two or three ten cases a day at the start of January this year. And suddenly by March, you were into the thousands of cases. And it was quite scary to, to a lot of New Zealanders who had got used to zero COVID. And I imagine this is how it is in China at the moment. A lot mm. of people that got used to zero COVID as the policy, it's quite hard to suddenly transition into that, um, that new situation like we, we deal with now mm. that, uh, you just have cases in the community and you just have to get used to living with that that risk. And mm. that's the case for the political leadership as well. So I don't know, to go back to the you know your original question, I don't know where it leads to from here. What it has become clear is that China has suddenly eased quite a few of the restrictions. Mm. Uh, there was clearly an edict that went out from on high uh, to, to, to relax some of these restrictions, even if numbers are at their highest yet. It's just become untenable. So suddenly, you know, the COVID vaccination passport certificates were no longer, the PCR tests were no longer required mm. uh, to go into, you know, shopping malls or take the bus or take the underground, the, the subways in, in, in parts of China. And, you know, there the probably will be a continuation of this relaxation of measures, which will probably ease the political protest, in my view. But the the issue then is, you know, will the hospitals cope? Mm. And given that, you know, the Chinese vaccines are just simply not as effective as the ones that have been used in the West, and given that right. vaccination rates are still quite low amongst the elderly, particularly when it comes to the booster, um, you know, China's got a problem. I don't know how you, you solve it. I don't think you can. I think you've got a bad situation whichever way you look. The current situation is just not tenable. It's mm. a real break on economic growth because of these lockdowns and shutdowns of factories um, and and you're getting political protests. Um, if you ease the restrictions, you're going to get high case numbers. That could also lead to protests. So, you know, in some ways it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a difficult situation wherever you look, but I, I think the, the leadership going back to Xi Jinping, I think they're, they're not blind to this. Right. I think they can see that the mm. writing is on the wall for the zero COVID policy. I think ideally they wanted to get past the People's Congress in the spring and it's easier to ease restrictions in warmer weather than colder weather. We've learned that over the last three, four right. years, haven't we, with COVID. So, um, you, you know, I think that's the preference. But, you know, the virus actually determines the, you know, the the actions to some extent and right now the numbers are going up even though it's winter time the restrictions might just have to be relaxed now and you're just going to have to put up with it and mm. uh, you know that's um probably the reality at the moment but i don't see i mean look these protests it's anyone's guess where they go from here we could build to something bigger i i tend to think it will probably be more like new zealand's mm. covid protests back in february and march there was talk then, you know, could this keep building into some bigger movement? They didn't. You know, once the COVID rules were relaxed, it pretty much dissipated. Um, and I think that's probably what will happen is my, my best guess. Mm. Mr. Miller, I want to move on to your expertise on New Zealand. Again, not too long ago, you've written numerous articles regarding Jacinda's uh, travel to countries in Southeast Asia. And again, this year, that not only we saw how China generated more noises under Belt and Road Initiative and continue to renew some of the political or economic contracts with the countries in Southeast Asia, but also you dive into article regarding the relationship between New Zealand and Vietnam at this moment. So, Mr. Villa, help us to understand what was the purpose for Jacinda to reach out to the countries in Southeast Asia and why is that significant for her to take such measure is it only for economic benefits or she was actually looking for something else from the perspective of in new zealand yes this was uh, during summit season so jacinda ardern went to the east asia summit in cambodia and she went to the apex summit in bangkok and in between she had a gap of a few days and 
this, of course, was always going to be used for a bilateral visit somewhere. I think we were all a little surprised that it was Vietnam that was mm. chosen. I was thinking, oh, it might be somewhere like Malaysia, mm. for example. There's a big diplomatic anniversary this year of New Zealand's relations with Malaysia, for, for example, and it hadn't been visited yet by Arden. But it, it turned out to be Vietnam, which is New Zealand's 15th biggest trading partner. So it's it's reasonably significant. And ASEAN countries in general are pretty big for New Zealand. Um, they are, you know, New Zealand's fourth biggest export market, if you take them as a group. So, you know, it doesn't get much bigger than that. You know, mm. it's only behind the likes of uh, China, the EU, the US, really, and then mm. you've got ASEAN. So, um, so it was a good choice. I mean, you know, it's natural if you've been in, at summits in, in, in ASEAN countries to go to an ASEAN country as your bilateral in between. And, uh, you know, it, it made sense. I guess what was interesting, particularly interesting about this visit was that it was a shift away from Jacinda Ardern's previous travel schedule this year, which had mm. overwhelmingly favoured going to Western countries. She had done two trips to the US. There was a trip uh, to the United Kingdom, I think two, uh, to the United Kingdom, to Belgium, Australia a couple of times, uh, and also to Singapore and Japan. Now, these were all countries that had supported Ukraine and had fallen on that, you know, that's, Western side of this new Cold War, mm. um, if you like. And uh, that had really become quite noticeable that Jacinda Ardern was traveling very much to friendly countries. Uh, by going to Vietnam, though, this was a bit, something a bit different again. And Vietnam, uh, you know, they're, they're not part of that big Western coalition uh, supporting Ukraine. And uh, they've got a policy which is a bit more like New Zealand's in terms of uh, with dealing with China, where they get on with China in some ways and, and don't get on in other ways. And effectively, you know, they're somewhere in the middle. And New, New Zealand fits very comfortably with that, that model. And the phrase um, bamboo diplomacy came up when I was mm. researching this article for to describe Vietnam's approach to China. In other words, you know, flexible uh, when needed, um, but tough when required. And uh, the fact that Vietnam is part of the, the new Indo-Pacific Economic Framework Initiative that the US has got, which is, you know, an economic vehicle to counter China. Um, but yet the, you know, the Vietnamese leader there was le visiting uh, Beijing not long ago and saying that China's relations with China were the country's top priority. It just shows that you can that Vietnam is, is playing both sides mm. um, to some extent. And they've got real differences with China, right, over the South China Sea in particular. Of but course. they, you know, they do see the importance of China for trade and especially, and there's a, the old communist alliance there with Vietnam and mm. China. So in, in New Zealand is in a, in a similar position. You know, we've got uh, China as our biggest trading partner, but We've also got strong relations with other Western countries. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think it was interesting because I think it fits into a, a wider recalibration we've seen by Jacinda Ardern just over the last few months. If you'd asked me six months ago, I would have said, look, New Zealand has moved closer towards the West mm. this year. And everything that New Zealand had done up to that point, up to about July, mm. had been to get closer to the West. It had been to uh, introduce sanctions against Russia. Uh, Jacinda Ardern went to the NATO summit in Belgium. Uh, she had a visit to the White House to meet, meet Joe Biden, issued quite a hawkish statement. There were lots of examples where New Zealand was getting quite close to, you know, Australia, the US and so forth. And it was getting moving away from uh, China after the invasion of, of Ukraine by mm. Russia. But the last few months, Jacinda Ardern has really recalibrated as she's talked a lot about dialogue and diplomacy and de-escalation. And she's been quite conciliatory towards China, emphasizing New Zealand's independent foreign policy. And she said she wants to visit China soon when the COVID situation allows. She wants to take a, a trade delegation of business mm. people uh, to China and and she had a good meeting with Xi Jinping at on the sidelines of APEC in Bangkok after that bilateral uh, visit to Vietnam. So as we end the year, you know, you were talking about the calendar there earlier. Um, I think you know New Zealand's 
is still more pro-Western than when we started. You know, mm. some of these things can't be put back in the bottle, like the sanctions, mm. autonomous sanctions. That was a huge shift for New Zealand to make in its foreign policy, to have the ability to put sanctions on, on countries. We didn't have that. We do now, only in terms of Russia, but the precedent is there. And But I think, you know, we, we're still more pro-Western than we were. Uh, I think the nature of Russia's war in Ukraine has is, is really led to that. But I think there is re a realisation now in the New Zealand government that we cannot let, uh, we cannot get on the wrong side of China. We just That's can't right. afford to because the the Chinese market is still by far the biggest for New Zealand. And we're not seeing Western countries really backing up their rhetoric about solidarity mm. with trade market access. And, and that's the problem for New Zealand. There aren't really any great alternatives. And New Zealand did sign a free trade deal with the EU this year, but it's quite a weak deal, uh, especially when it comes to the main agricultural exports, the beef, dairy products. It's still very, very limited in terms of access. So I think there was a growing realisation in the government that you just could not continue along this path of being just so pro-Western because, you know, the, the real danger would that you would just go too far and at some point Beijing would just have enough. Mm. And we've seen what they, uh, what Beijing uh, did uh, in terms of Australia mm. when they got, uh, they got angry with Australia over the COVID period. Mm, and that's right. You know, Australia found its, its wine exports, its barley exports, you know, under punitive tariffs. New Zealand just can't afford that. You know, New Zealand, you know, it would just be an absolute calamity for New Zealand to have punitive tariffs placed on it, on its milk powder exports, for example, because it's a huge percentage of New Zealand's exports. And, uh, you know, the taxes from all of that goes to pay mm. the schools, the roads, the hospitals, all the things that uh, Jacinda Ardern's voters value and there's an election coming up next year. So Jacinda Ardern's Labour Party is up for re-election. They're, you know, they, they need to be mindful of some of these, these issues. Mm. Mr. Miller, I know you are very busy. Now, I want to end our conversation by going back to something also very important for us to address. Right now, the whole world is paying attention to one of the exciting events in the sports arena or in the sports field, which is the World Cup. Of course, that it doesn't matter if you are a soccer fan or if you are following the World Cup closely. But ultimately, this is a very exciting um, activity. But meanwhile, people are also saying that, again, you wrote an article as well regarding the issue of human rights. So help us to understand why is it important for us to continue to talk about uh, the human rights issue within the country and while the whole world still paying attention to the excitement of the sports. So in other words, why does it matter uh, when we pay attention to the human rights issue uh, and uh, we've been addressing this for so long, what is the purpose of doing that? Well, I think, you know, when we look at Qatar, the world spotlight is on Qatar at the moment with the World Cup. So I think it would be remiss of us not to consider uh, the situation of people living there. Mm. And there are many, many migrant workers who earn very little. And this is the richest country on earth, Qatar. Um, so, you know, there are real, there are real human rights issues. Uh, the deaths of migrant workers, uh, in Qatar building infrastructure for this World Cup, mm. uh, you know, quite shocking. At the same time, I think, you know, I, I disagree with some of the, uh, the stronger statements made uh, by commentators on this World Cup, the ones who are um, according for boycotts and saying, you know, it's the worst World Cup and it's, um, you know, we, we shouldn't be supporting this event and we shouldn't be watching this event because it's been, uh, you know, because of the human rights abuses mm. and, and so forth. I, I would always argue for engagement and, you know, Qatar has improved mm. and, they, you know, they, they are aware of the problems, I think, the leadership there and they, they are working on it. And the situation has got better for migrant workers. There's the uh, International Labour Office, uh, International Labour Organization has an office, a dedicated office in, in Doha now working on improving, um, the, the, you know, the rights of, of migrant workers. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, the situation is getting, is getting better. It takes time though. And, and that's the thing. I think we're, a lot of people are very impatient. They want to see, yeah, everything happening right now. But, uh, you know, Qatar has, has certainly uh, made 
a big step. They've got a minimum wage now, mm. which is a real first pretty much uh, amongst countries uh, there in the Middle East. So um, there are real improvements. I, I think we need to be very careful about making perfect the enemy of the good. Mm. Um, there are problems even in every country, including uh, my own in New Zealand. There are you know, human rights issues and there are things that we wish were better. You know, there's, there's problem, there are problems in every country. I don't think that should mean that you disengage and uh, you, you know, boycott things. I think that puts us on a fast track to war. Mm. So I, I would always argue for the en engagement route. And uh, I think, you know, this is the best chance. You know, when you've got the spotlight on on Qatar before the World Cup, this is when things really, you know, can Im Im improve because, you know, the world is watching. And Qatar knows that. So they'll be, uh, I no doubt, working hard to continue to improve their uh, you know the the standard of living of of the migrant workers and the the human rights situation in their country. Beyond that, though, um, well, I do find it troubling in some ways that uh, Westerners uh, are coming to Qatar and are trying to impose uh, a degree of of Western values on on Qatar when it comes to things like LGBT rights. Mm. I, I think we need to be very careful here that this is, you know, a form of Western imperialism in a sense. Uh, you know, Qatar is a, an Islamic country. Mm. Um, it has got its own cultural norms and practices. That's right. There is a degree of, there is a degree of respect here. And, you know, I think we need to be careful about how we are seen. If we barge in to someone else's party and try and impose our own values, I don't think that's going to make the other, the other group particularly sympathetic. You just that's think right. about it in your own life. If you go to someone else's party, gate crash and tell them that you should be, they should be like you, you're not going to probably be very successful in that's that right. approach. And I, I do find that there's a colonial aspect um, to some of, some of this. And I think we need to be think very carefully. I don't think it's actually in the interest of, 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 of gay rights activists or LGBT rights activists to necessarily go hard like this. I think the softly, softly approach is probably going to have more success in, in, in the Middle East. So, you know, I think this word respect is, is, is useful here. Um, I think, okay, there's a, always we have to be careful about this because there's always the aspect of human rights being universal. And, you know, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is what it says. Universal, it should apply to everyone. Mm. Um, but it's how you go about achieving this. And like with China, I think if you go out with a big stick necessarily, particularly, you know, as I say from New Zealand's perspective, if you go with a big stick and, and so forth, you're probably not going to get very far uh, because, you know, no one's really interested in New Zealand's big stick. Um, I think the engagement route, talking, going the dialogue approach is probably going to be more successful in the long term. And to that end, I argued that in this article, you know, New Zealand should open an embassy in Doha. If Doha wants to be the next Dubai, we should be we should be there. And New Zealand doesn't have an embassy in, in Qatar. It serves Qatar from uh, the UAE, mm. uh, which is problematic because it's really Qatar's main strategic rival, and it's got mm. a lot of similarities. So, serving Qatar out of out of out of Abu Dhabi and the United Arab Emirates perhaps isn't the smartest option. And if New Zealand does want a free trade agreement with the Gulf Cooperation Council, the the group of six wealthy countries in the Arabian Peninsula that includes both. Uh, Qatar and the United Arab Emirates, I think it's probably going to have to open more embassies and show a bit more uh, more willingness to engage. And so embassies and top-level visits, uh, I think Jacinda Ardern needs to head to the Middle East. It's a part of the world she hasn't visited in the five years she's been Prime Minister, and I think mm. it's, it's absolutely time now for her uh, to do so. Well, Mr. Miller, I agree with you 100%, because again, today... Even though we are approaching the end of the year, but one thing we have to realize that when we come to global agenda or uh, global uh, projects, that it's better that we work together rather than to be separated. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to speak to uh, Mr. Jeffrey Miller. And Mr. Mr. Miller is the Democracy Project's international analyst and also writes on current New Zealand foreign policy and related geopolitical issues. Mr. Miller, it's always been a pleasure speaking to you and thank you so much 
for taking your time to be on the show again as we go forward and we're hoping that 2023 we're going to have more to appear on our show continue to help us to understand this geopolitical shifts not only from new zealand but also across the continent again mr miller thank you so much for doing this